Whatever happened, Neanderthals have extinct now, but extinction may not be what it used to be if you leave behind a genome. We can already read the information in the DNA from extinct species like Neanderthals, and we can synthesize that DNA, and we can put it into cells that are growing in the laboratory. Then we can look at what the gene does and how the gene functions differently from the human version of the gene. That was how we found out that Neanderthals were redheads. Well, George Church, professor of genetics at Harvard Medical School, suggested that you could create an entire Neanderthal genome in the laboratory and put that DNA into a modern human cell and reproduce or, or, or resurrect a Neanderthal person. Well, obviously, there are a lot of bioethical issues here, not least the need for a woman to decide that she's going to be the first mother of a Neanderthal child. The point is, though, that we not only have the technology to look into people, to find things about our ancestry, we will likely sometime in the future have the technology to create with the knowledge we have. Attached to this lecture are a couple of interviews with Church and a link to get you to the TED de-extinction event that was held in March 2013. Now, eventual de-extinction, as they put it, of extinct species like these is now a real possibility. And the TED event was about beginning public discussion of, a, of how de-extinction projects can best proceed responsibly. OK, then, let's have a look now at uh, the recent evolution of our species. That remains a very interesting and difficult undertaking. Within the last 100,000 years, a small founding population of humans in Africa has expanded to colonise nearly every part of the world. During this time, we've developed complex languages and cultures, we have medicine, we modify our environment to make it habitable. Some people think that culture protects us from evolution. We change our environment rather than change ourselves. Some people think that culture is actually an accelerator pedal and drives our evolution, particularly as for much of this, this time we lived in isolated populations. Not surprisingly, there's disagreement as to the extent to which local environments in Africa, Europe, Asia and elsewhere have altered our genetics and biology. It is, a, however, incontrovertible that humans differ in many ways from skin colour to immune systems. While some traits probably became widespread by chance, others may have given their owners some sort of evolutionary advantage and were therefore favoured by natural or sexual selection. Skin colour is, is a clear example of our changing according to the environment. Skin colour correlates with latitude because melanin is a natural sunblock. It's an example of natural selection. We've also been subject to sexual selection. That The Maasai, they have a tribe in East Africa. Maasai women prefer taller men, and Maasai men are amongst the tallest in the world. That's sexual selection. A study that appeared in the prestigious journal PNAS in April 2013 reported that penis size matters to women, though within limits. The, the findings suggest that women's preferences could have fueled the evolution of the human male penis, which is longer and thicker than that of any other primate. Well, a puzzle about a lot of these theories is that one would expect, given the strength of sexual selection, that all men would have large penises and all women would fit some standard idea of beauty. In fact, you must have noticed, we are immensely variable. Compared to other species, human beings seem particularly prone to mutations of the face, mutations that change our appearance. Some of these mutations seem trivial, even though they're conspicuous. Now, in his book, The Third Chimpanzee, Jared Diamond suggests that there may have been selection for mutations that allow us to be more tribal, to distinguish us from them, whoever them might be. Diamond points out that our cultural differences in language and religion heavily influence mating decisions, encouraging us to discriminate against others. Once cultural differences had achieved initial separation, he suggests genetic differences accumulated that made it easier for us to notice variation and to distinguish our own kind from others. But in essence, Diamond is suggesting that there's been selection for discrimination fodder, for genes that produce conspicuous characteristics that allow us to discriminate against other people. OK, well, let's have a look then at what the genomes have told us so far about the evolution of differences between people. Mathematically minded geneticists have models and methods that can detect rapid evolutionary changes in genomes. And when they look at the similarities and differences between people, they find loci, sites in the genome, that are changed in different human uh, populations over the last 10,000 years. As I mentioned before, every major innovation led to new selective pressures, which in turn led to the selection of genes. 
The most spectacular innovation has been agriculture, with its associated high-density populations and new diseases and changes of diet. Dietary changes required genetic changes. That started a long time ago with eating a lot of meat and taming fur. It's continued with more recent innovations like drinking milk. When we first tried milk, the lactose it contains made us ill. So we developed a cultural trick. We turned milk into cheese. But to really exploit milk, we needed mutations. All human babies produce the enzyme lactase to digest milk lactose. Now, mutations in regulatory sequences that allow some of us to produce the lactase enzyme right throughout life, not just when we are babies, allowed us to be vampires, mutants that live off the milk of another species. The oldest mutation for this appeared 8,000 years ago in Europe. And this 8,000-year-old uh, mutant is found throughout Europe and India, and is suspected of being behind the massive expansion of the Indo-Europeans, which will eventually determine the spoken language of half mankind. This, this would have all started with a mutation in just one person. That proves, if anything does, that a single person can change the world. While well, the Indo-European languages include Spanish, English, Hindi, Russian, Sanskrit, Sanskrit is probably close to the mother tongue of the person with the mutation, well, another popular set of mutations allows many of us to consume alcohol. It may surprise you to know that this ability may have been crucial when we took to living in crowded cities. Drinking alcoholic drinks was healthier than drinking plain water as it avoids waterborne pathogens like cholera. Genes that reduce the risk of alcoholism therefore prevailed. Okay, so I've given a couple of examples where the roles of the rapidly evolving genes is mostly clearly understood. I could also give you examples involving disease resistance, metabolism, and the shape of some of our body parts. But the function of most of the rapidly evolving DNA regions are still unknown, which suggests we are more different from each other than we know. In 2013, a team led by Panda Sabeti at the Broad Institute examined the genomes of 179 people from around the world and they identified 412 DNA regions that were selected for in different populations. Well, a challenge, of course, is to find out how each mutation in these 412 regions changed us and how. So Betty's group focused on one gene, EDAR, EDA, known to play a role in the development of hair, teeth and sweat glands. A version called EDAR370A arose in China about 30,000 years ago and is found mostly in East Asians and some Native Americans. Now, previous studies had already linked this uh, allele with increased skull pair thickness and shovel-shaped incisors in humans. To further explore the consequences of variety 370A, Jana Kamberoff of Harvard Medical School put 370A into mice. The resulting genetically modified mice had thicker hair fibers, more sweat glands in their foot pads, and less fatty mammary glands which in other words means smaller breasts. When they looked, they confirmed that Chinese people with variety 370A had thicker hair fibres and more sweat glands on their hands. EDAR 370A clearly has multiple functions. In genetics, we call a gene with multiple functions pleiotropic. Well, due to the pleiotropy of 370A, it's not clear which of the things it does is beneficial and so would have been selected for. Perhaps extra sweat glands helped humans keep cool in the humid Chinese climate, or perhaps Asian men simply found small breasts attractive. Well, evolution is seldom pure and it's really simple. So perhaps both of these things are true. The era of comparing genomes for selection is now in full swing. Typically in these screens, hundreds of regions show evidence of recent selection. So we're very lucky mice are so similar to us. It's estimated that 80% of genes in the mouse genome have exactly one counterpart in us. Less than 1% have no counterpart. Through mouse models, we may be able to work out what our rapidly evolving DNA sequences do, proving our understanding of how humans were shaped by evolution, and perhaps even how it continues to this day.